Good evening and welcome to the District 1 City Council debate. I'm Ross Reynolds from KUOW. I'm Heidi Groover from the Seattle Times. And the candidates tonight are Lisa Herbold, the incumbent. She served as City Council Member Nicolacata's legislative aide, coordinating the 1997 campaign. She was elected to the City Council in 2015. Lisa got 51% of the votes in the August primary. Her opponent, Phil Tavel, got 33% of the votes. It's Phil's second run for the council. He spent the last 13 years as a public defender. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Tonight's debate will consist of question and answers where the candidates will have 60 seconds to respond. Heidi and I will reserve the right to ask follow-up questions and allow for rebuttals. Tonight's questions come in part from the audience and we're gonna end the debate with closing statements from each of the candidates. Candidates, your responses are timed, and as we mentioned before, we will cut you off if you go over your time. And audience, please hold all your applause until the end of the debate. Candidates are allotted equal speaking time, and any audience applause or disruptions will be taken out of that candidate's total speaking time. All right, our first question tonight. Uh, elections are choices. Why should voters choose you rather than your opponent? Please be as specific as possible. And Phil Tavel, you will answer first. Thank you. Well. In politics, luckily, every two, four, six years, depending on the position, we as the electorate get the opportunity to elect new leadership and determine if the direction we're going in is right or wrong. For me, I want to be the leader here in this city that can bring new experiences and new skills to the table. I was a physics teacher. I was a business owner. I've been a trial lawyer. I've been a judge. And for those things, I'm bringing a lot of new experiences to the table. And with the problems we're seeing in this city, that's what we need. We need someone who's been around and done a lot of things in the real world. And especially owning a business is something that we need to have on the city council. We also need a strong voice that is an advocate, not just for one group, but for every group, and someone that will listen to everybody in their community, and someone who is a part of that community all the time. That's what makes me the choice for this position. Thank you. So um, I bring, I think, a lot of really important experience at a time when the council is really going to need um, experienced lawmakers and representatives. We are going to have at least four new council members, maybe more, on the city council. And I think to serve West Seattle, you need somebody who knows how to get things done. I have a proven track record of delivering for constituents in District 1. Whether or not it's um, addressing day-to-day cons -day constituent issues that folks contact in my office on, um, things like uh, getting the street lights fixed on a street where there's a lot of assaults or getting an abandoned building boarded up or getting playground equipment replaced. I deliver for our district because I know how City Hall works. It's important to have somebody who can do that but can also pass important public policy that ensures that the city is moving forward on our most um, our most challenging um, uh, policy issues that we really need to be moving forward on, and, and I want to represent you in doing that. Thank you. This question will start with you, Lisa. How would you separate the needs of homeless people who are trying to get back on their feet from homeless people who refuse offers of help? Well, I don't think of it as um, separating, um, addressing the needs. I think we have to be doing, doing both. Um, I think... Um, my experience in working on, on these issues of social services um, no, is, is, is uh, uh, that you have to devise different interventions for different problems. And, and each person is, is unique. And that's why with, when you're looking at how to ensure that people move inside from outside, you need interventions that are 
tailored to the people's needs. And I, th I believe that um, the more engagement that we have with people, the more we could have um, better successes around those engagements. So that's why I'm a proponent of enhanced shelter, which is 24-7 shelter with case management. It has proven outcomes because it's low barrier. People can come with their pets and their partners, and they have that, that sustained case management that has proven outcomes to permanent housing. Phil Tavel, 60 seconds on that question. Through expanding our lead program, through expanding our navigation teams, and by supporting homeless service providers who have proven positive results, those are the people that are going out into the communities of people who are homeless, who are living on the street, and they provide that opportunity for those people to say, yes, I want help. These are the things I need. And if we expand those programs and we expand those services in the city that are functional and productive, then we'll be able to reach out to all of the people in the city that want that help, whether it's a little financial help, whether it's issues with mental health problems or issues with substance abuse. We will be able to identify those people quickly and help get them to a place where they're going to be on a path to have a better life. That way, when we do that effectively long enough, the people that are left are the ones that are refusing the services and the people with long-time issues that we're going to have to deal with separately. Phil Tavel, uh, you've said if we continue to define the problem of, of homelessness as an issue of housing, we're going to continue to fail. What did you mean by that? We ha you have 60 seconds, and then uh, Lisa Herbold, you'll have 60 seconds to respond. I mean, being a public defender for most of the last 15 years, a lot of the people on the street in distress right now were my clients. And even during this process of running for office, I've gone out and I've spoken to people who are living on the street. And it's obvious when you see them and you talk to them that it, it's not just a few dollars for rent that is the difference for most of the people. It's the fact that they have issues. They have undiagnosed and untreated mental health issues. They have substance abuse issues. And they're self-medicating those mental health issues with those substances. And what I'm saying is that we need to help them. And just providing housing isn't the answer. It's identifying the fact that there is a big crisis here. And if we just call it about affordable housing, we miss the bigger problem, which is the underlying root cause of the homelessness, which are mental health issues and substance abuse issues. So we can argue all day long about what the greatest causes of homelessness are. Um, we have, there's data that shows that there are um, some top causes of homelessness. Uh, lack of income, uh, the rent's too high, substance abuse disorders, mental illness and, and disability of the, and, um, and domestic violence are the top, top reasons. But regardless of what the causes of homelessness, the, the solution to homelessness is always going to be housing. And that's why permanent supportive housing is proven to be the model that works for people regardless of what their barriers are, regardless of what their troubles are. Permanent supportive housing has wraparound services. Sometimes we refer to it as housing first. And 95% of the people who get into permanent supportive housing stay in permanent supportive housing. So these are the outcomes that we want to see with our city investments, and it works. A District 5 council candidate, Ann Davison Settler, has a bold plan. Build three FEMA-style relief shelters at an abandoned Renton Sam's Club, a North Seattle Sam's Club, and at an old mill site on Harbor Island in the port of Seattle. Sattler thinks she can house up to 5,500 people at these three sites for a cost of about $7.9 million. Uh, Lisa Herbold, you just said uh, housing is always the solution. Would you support such a plan? So housing is a solution to homelessness. Uh, Mayor uh, Gavin Newsom said a couple weeks ago, um, shelter is the solution to not having a place to sleep. Housing is the the, the solution to being homeless. People who are in shelter are still homeless. People who are in FEMA tents are still homeless. What you've solved is the, 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 the problem of not having a place to sleep with a tent. But um, that said, I commissioned an audit of um, the navigation team's work last year, and the city auditor identified the use of a FEMA tent as something that the city should look into. Um, this was the audit that I commissioned. I support looking into that as, a, as an option. We discussed it during the budget process last year. Councilmember Mosqueda uh, made a proposal for it. I was the only council member who supported it. We are entering the budget process again. I think it's a worthy, um, a worthy option 
option, again, particularly since the city auditor identified it as something that we should, we should look into, and I support doing so. Phil, would you support this idea for FEMA-style relief shelters? So I think that actually is a good first step. I mean, because obviously one of the things we've got is we have people living in conditions and places all around the city where they shouldn't, where it's not good, it's not healthy for them, and it's not good and healthy for everybody else around them. And so to that end, bringing them into a place that is covered, that has access to services, and like the other question asked about how do we get the people who want help and who need help and are able to ask for it, how do we get them that help? One of those things is to bring them into locations where they can be safer, they can be fed, they can be clothed, and they can start looking at what is that path to moving beyond that, to finding housing, finding jobs, and finding hope. So I do support that as a first step, and uh, I do think we obviously need to go much beyond that to really fix this problem. So let's stay on this issue a bit. Uh, the, the Durkin administration has dramatically increased no-notice removals of homeless encampments and is taking several steps to crack down on dilapidated RVs that are used as homes, but has not significantly increased the shelter capacity this year. What do you think of the mayor's approach? 60 seconds and Phil Tavel, you're first. I mean, I think the mayor is attempting to do something, which is good. I mean, we declared an emergency years ago, and myself and the people that I talked to on the doors have not seen the city acting with any kind of urgency. Um, you know, and now we're starting to see some activity, just some sense of moving forward in some way. I don't necessarily, or I do think that we can do better things than that. You know, the RVs that are dilapidated, the ones that people have purchased for very little money, and you can see them. I mean, unfortunately, they're putting waste into the streets, and they are not healthy for anybody. That is a good thing that we have to deal with and work on. But as far as the no notice is concerned, and as far as just sweeping people away, it's, it's dehumanizing, and that's not the answer. So we, like the Ninth Circuit Court said, we need to put into place shelters and places for people to go and choices. So until we really do that effectively, we should be careful how we're removing people from where they are. So the role I've played as it relates to the navigation team, because I recognize that the city has a responsibility to maintain public property, um, and the encampments are usually on, on public property. Um, and the, the city has a responsibility through the executive departments to maintain public property. So my role as it relates to the navigation team has really been um, to provide oversight um, and guidance for continuous improvement of their processes. And so I mentioned earlier that I commissioned an audit of the navigation team's practices, um, and that audit has, has resulted in a number of, of recommendations that have improved the work that the navigation team does, specifically as it relates to making sure that the uh, NAV team members have access to, um, to uh, funding for specifically for diversion. There are a number of other recommendations that we're going to be following up on during the budget process this year. Um, the uh, other thing that I think should be mentioned as it relates specifically to RVs, I have championed the RV remediation program, including funding to expand that program where the city identifies high priority locations um, that need to be cleaned. And uh, again, there are 400 RVs throughout the city at any given time, so we have to prioritize the work that we're doing. If I could just follow up 30 seconds for each of you. Um, so Lisa Herbold, starting with you, can you talk more about your response to the mayor's specific RV legislation? I believe you've had some concerns about that. And then Phil, you'll have the chance to respond. Sure. Um, like the city has the ability to shut down a rental unit that is um, a rental unit that is unfit for human habitation. I see the um, ability, and, and that's, a, that's a situation where there's um, somebody's paying rent to somebody. I think the RV situation is very similar. Um, if somebody is paying rent, they have a right to expect a certain level of service, and if, it, that, if it's uninhabitable, they, the person should not be able to collect rent. Um, if we are going to take those RVs, though, in those instances, we should provide emergency assistance, financial assistance, like we do currently under the, uh, uh, the apartment rental um, uh, closures. Okay. Bill? And I'm supportive of the, of the current legislation. Okay. Lisa Herbold, what have you done to end old programs that aren't working to reduce homelessness so that money's freed up for new programs that would? Sure. So um, one of the 
big things that the city has been doing um, over the last couple years is, again, um, we received recommendations through um, the uh, Poppy Report, and we have um, the Pathways Home Plan, uh, which has a number of recommendations, and one of the big recommendations was to transform our basic shelter system to enhanced shelter. So we've been doing a combination of both building new enhanced shelter um, and also converting existing basic shelter. Basic shelter is mats on the floor. Um, you have to leave at 7 o'clock in the morning and you have to get in line at 6 o'clock in the evening. You don't have a place to leave your belongings. You can't come with your pets or your partners. Um, and, it's, and it's considered high barrier and that's one of the reasons why people um, um, sometimes from outside don't accept that shelter. Um, and so we're gradually transforming as much of our basic shelter to enhance shelter so people have a place to leave their belongings, so people have a way to engage with case management rather than during the day rather than wandering around the streets. Phil, do you think the city's done enough to end programs that are not working to end homelessness to free up money for programs that can be tried? Absolutely not. You can look at the All Home website, in fact, which uh, Councilmember Herbold has pointed to to say that you can take a look and see what are the outcomes from those providers. They have 370 providers that they look at. Of those providers, the number that have actually met five out of five of the targeted standards, and they even state minimum standards, the number of the 370 of those that meet those minimum standards on five out of five targets is one. One out of 370. Four out of five, it's 32, less than 10% and you barely cross 50% when you look at three of those five targeted standards. And again, those are the minimum standards. So the fact is, it is obvious, it is out there, that we are not holding those people accountable. And in fact, in many instances, we are just lowering standards to make sure that more of them meet that, and that's not appropriate. Let's stay with that. 30 seconds for you, Lisa Herbold, to respond, and then Phil, you'll get another 30 seconds. I appreciate the chance. So the All Home website is um, not just for the city of Seattle, it's uh, for King County. So um, a lot of the data that you see on there is not just uh, city-funded um, uh, providers. But one thing, we just had a really important conversation um, at Council Chambers the other day with HSD director about the outcomes that we designed for these uh, these interventions and we asked the question why is it that basic shelter has the same outcomes uh, uh, f as as enhanced shelter when we know that enhanced shelter is so much more important but the, the what the, the purpose that basic shelter serves is to help people in an emergency so we need to be careful about the outcomes that we expect from our, our providers and they need that's to be 30, designed that's time Phil 30 seconds we're not. <laughs> I mean, we're just not doing it. I mean, you can look at that. It doesn't matter if those numbers are regional. One out of 370 still represents the fact that that is not reasonable in any stretch by any definition. And I think we can tell that, you know, we are spending so much money on the administrative side of this homeless problem to these homeless service providers that the money is not getting to the people who need that help. And that's what we've got to fix. And by doing that, we have to look at the providers that are not succeeding, which by most accounts is 369 out of 370, and hold them accountable. There's a proposal in the King County Council to appropriate more money for bus tickets to offer to people experiencing homelessness so that they can leave. Uh, do you support a program like this for Seattle? And if, if so, why? If not, why? Phil Tavel, you're first. I mean, look, if people, and, and I've met a lot of people who many have been clients, a lot of them are other people that I've just come across and talked to, who came here have found themselves in a different situation than when they hoped either the person they were coming to see, something happened, they left, they passed away, a job went away and they couldn't find something else, and they literally do not have the ability to get home. So in those situations, I appreciate the fact that there actually is money for us to say, look, if the issue is you can't even make it home, we'll help you get there. And if they want to be here, we need to provide them with the services to help them. But I do support a program where we can help someone go back home to where they have a support system if they found themselves trapped in a place where they don't have a support system. So there's been much to do made about the proposal from the King County Council member. Um, in fact, I mentioned earlier that my audit 
um, resulted in a uh, recommendation that the navigate navigation team have access to diversion services. Diversion services can be a lot of different things, but one of the tools in the diversion services toolbox is family reunification. So the city of Seattle has been doing this. Um, our, the, our city funded outreach workers have had access to diversion funds that serve this purpose for years now. And we now newly, again, because of the, the work of the city auditor, we now newly have navigation team members offering these family reunification services as well. Let's uh, turn to transportation next. Lisa, you've been a vocal opponent of the proposed First Avenue streetcar, but if, this, if the city is to cancel this project, we've got two other streetcar lines that will be disconnected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the end of the world, that those two street lines be disconnected because there's great bus service that connects them. Fantastic bus service um, connecting both of those street lines and um, our streetcar lines. But the other thing that I think is really important is this um, district, District 1, um, is has really strong feelings um, about what we want to see in our Sound Transit 3 um, alignment. And we really want to make sure that we have um, a tunnel for the junction and a tunnel at Pigeon Ridge and we know that that's going to cost more money and other parts of the system are going to cost more money and we're going to need third party funding in addition to this sound transit money and that's at least 50 million dollars that could be used as um, as third party funding in addition to the bond financing that we have committed to the um, the center city streetcar nearly a hundred million dollars together for what I refer to as a shopping shuttle. Phil Tavel, you said maybe to building the rest of the streetcar line. Could you expand upon that? Yeah, I think it's actually you know a program that I'd like to see done. I would like to see that connector finished. Um, however, I know after living in this city for 21 years, we deal with the fact that there are a lot of transportation projects that take way too long and take forever to come about or possibly don't even ever come about. And the truth is, at this point, we have far more pressing needs right now than that particular connector. I think it is a great project that we should do, and I think it would help the city, it would help commerce in this city, it would help tourism, but just not right now. I think we need to address the pressing issues. When I talk to people at the doors, that's not the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth thing that comes up. People are concerned about public safety, about homelessness, about affordability, and so to that end, I support that project eventually when we get to the point where we're dealing with our other issues. You've both said that you support a tunnel to West Seattle as part of the ST3 light rail construction package. Uh, such a tunnel could cost up to $700 million and push back the opening of that route past its original 2030 goal. Uh, Lisa Herbold, I know you've just talked about the streetcar funding. That's still a fraction of how much a tunnel could cost. So where should this money for a tunnel come from and why is it worth a longer wait? Uh, Phil Tavel, you're first. Well, what I would say is some of the presentations I've seen about the tunnel and about the other lines have told us that they're only 5% of the way through the process. And at 5% of the way through the process, you can't tell me we know exactly how much it's going to cost. The importance, I believe, for our community, and I know Council Member Herbold and I both agree on this. I mean, we even high-fived at the stranger endorsement meeting over the fact that we both support the tunnel, is the fact that this is a generational choice for our district and for our neighborhoods that we do not want to see that concrete monstrosity put through the middle of our city or our neighborhoods. And so to that end, we don't yet know how much it would cost, and if it's an issue of money, there are partners. There's the port, there's Nucor Steel, there are other interests, and there are other ways to get money, to apply for federal funds, for state funds. So when we get farther down the process and we can actually say we really know how much it's gonna cost, and as long as we know that it's geologically possible and possible from an engineering standpoint, I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that that tunnel happens, and we'll cross the funding bridge when we actually have an idea of what that looks like. So we are getting to the point where we need to be getting serious, though, about third-party funding. Um, and I do agree, um, Sound Transit hasn't built a tunnel that um, hasn't actually reduced in cost as it's been designed. So there's value engineering, and the costs come down the closer you get to 100% design. And every tunnel that Sound Transit has built has has resulted in reduced cost through that design process. So I think I think the 
costs, the price tag will come down. Um, there are other um, other neighborhoods that are um, that have needs that are requiring uh, third party funding. It's not just West Seattle though, so we need to get together. But I I am also I'm really concerned that I'm I appear so far to be talking, be the only person talking about where those dollars are coming from and we need to get a process going because by the time they're done the EIS, we have to have identified those dollars or else they're going to move forward with the preferred alignment which y'all voted on that's, which has that monstrosity going time, through. That's time but I do want to ask, so do you have a specific funding source other than the streetcar in mind? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeding the conversation with a hundred million dollars. <laughs> Uh, according to the Seattle Municipal Court records, there's a Phil Tavel who owes $1,070 in fines going back to 2015 for driving without insurance and driving with expired license plates. Is that you, Phil Tavel? That is me. And why haven't you paid your fines? Uh, well, actually, it's because the fines can be removed from collections by a judge so that you actually are not just paying the, the full amount, but you're just paying what the amount of the original fine was. And I have not done that yet. Okay, this is the part where you'll get to each ask one another a question. And, uh, excuse me, did you have one here? We, yes. I think we, yes. we just have an audience question we want to get in here. Uh, so what, what is your position on plans for converting uh, municipal golf courses in Seattle into affordable housing or some other use, uh, Phil Tavel? Um, yeah, I do not want to see that happen. <laughs> I think that park space, obviously, luckily, we already have something in place that says if you remove that park space, it has to be replaced acre by acre with other green space. Um, we do not have a problem, in my opinion, in this city that is large enough to lose one of those golf courses that actually provides a good amount of funding for the parks department and that is also something that provides access to green space and outdoors and activity for people of low income, for women, for immigrants, for communities of color, because it's affordable and it's accessible. So I don't believe there should be any plans for developing that at this point. Likewise, uh, I don't know of any plan to convert our golf courses into housing. Um, there's a there's been a consultant study that the mayor's office commissioned, um, but was really focused on uh, the revenue associated with golf and the cost to maintain the golf course. And if you look at the recommendations of the study, they're really pro golf. They're actually suggesting that we do things like look at the St Andrews golf course model in Scotland, which is a golf course that um, isn't only for golf. It has other open space um, uses associated with the course. And I think that would be really fantastic uh, for the, um, the West Seattle golf course because I know my constituents in the junction are tired of being told by the parks department that they have enough open space because they have the golf course and that they should not be lobbying for more open space because not everybody can, can use the golf course for all purposes. So finding another uh, more uses of that space while still maintaining golf I think would be fantastic. Now you'll each have a chance to ask a short, concise question of one another. Mm -hmm. We'll start with you, Phil. What's your question for Lisa Herbold? So Lisa, if you're reelected, uh, do you plan on reintroducing the head tax? And if so, how much per employee do you tend to seek? And what is your plan for that revenue? So uh, in a word, no, I don't have a plan to reintroduce the head tax. Um, I think it's... Uh, pretty uh, coincidental that I just got an email from a small business owner in Kirkland today um, who was reading an article about our head tax discussions and she's, she's like, you know, we pay $110 uh, per employee and it's not a big deal and I asked, I asked our mayor about it because I was in unincorporated King County and then Kirkland incorporated us and I asked our mayor about it and our mayor's a small business owner, uh, owns a, a Ford dealership and the mayor said, hey, this is a great source of revenue if there was another source to pay for our needs, I'd consider it. So it's not unusual to have a conversation in a state that has um, um, such an upside down tax system when, where the people with the least money are paying the largest percentage of their income um, uh, on, on, um, uh, on taxes where the people with the most income are paying the least. We need to address that and I'm really excited about the um, large earners income tax that I work to pass working its way through the courts. We got a favorable, um, favorable decision in the appeals courts and I'm looking forward to the state Supreme Court. That's time, but now it's your turn to ask a question to Phil. So, um, Phil, you're the business back candidate with 
the downtown chamber spending more than $167,000 to support you. You yourself started 15 businesses since 2001, and the state stepped in to dissolve 12 of them, some of them more than once, when you failed to comply with basic requirements. One was hit with two tax liens, including one from the IRS for $26,000 that you apparently still owe, and a lawsuit suit for stiffing a contractor for $3,000. Meanwhile, instead of paying these bills, you've contributed $17,000 to your own campaign. Concise question, please. And how, how can District 1 voters trust you with our tax dollars when you've, um, uh, how can they trust your judgment when facing the city's most urgent problems? Um, I, I haven't. <laughs> Um, so so I'm, that's I'm, not you? <clears throat> that's not Phil Tavel, who yeah, has started I, 15 businesses since 2001? No. No, I haven't. Uh -huh. I, okay. Well, I, I have a list well, of 15 businesses where you are listed as, it, as the governor. Um, 21 Founders LLC, Philip Alden Ta Tavel. Is question? I mean, I, like, well, I'm just... You're just I, saying... I, I, the question was asked, and you're denying that this right. is. Or you're denying the premise of the question. You say you're not the person on those. Right. So. Right. Yeah. No. I guess I'm saying though there is a limit to the time. I mean, I'm happy to address that, or if you want to give me the list, I'll take a look. But I mean, I I haven't. Okay. So. Is that you in the document that you're looking at now, Phil? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm looking at a document. Yeah. And so actually, several of these were ones that were actually started by a former business partner of mine that I actually could have been listed still as the owner when those things happen. The reason I'm saying that is I, I know that I do not have those, you know, personal owing and I've never had a, you know, my head of law firm, there was back in 2001 my video game company and I had my own law firm under my own name and I worked with Seattle Asian Medicine and Martial Arts and a couple of those were actually just ones that were possible things to do with my law firm that we ended up not doing. Um, but I got to be honest, I would actually just have to go back and talk to one of the business partners that I had, especially with the ones that are, uh, you know, were formed 10 years ago. So this is another audience question. Uh, how would you control the growth in city spending in preparation for a possible economic downturn? Phil Tavel, you're first. Well, I think actually Mayor Durkin had the right idea. I think she said to all of the departments, find a way to save 10% of that money. Find a way to put that money aside so that if we do have an economic downturn, we've done that. And so I would support that going to those different departments and even if they needed to work with them and finding the places that we've got projects that we don't need right now, places that we could find inefficiencies in our spending. I know from talking to a lot of people that work in our city government when they talk about SDOT and they talk about City Light and they talk about the public public utilities, they tell me about the fact that there are a lot of projects that are not being managed properly and the money is not being spent very well. And I think even here in District 1, we can see a lot of that in some of the projects going on in our streets and how often that a street gets torn up and then shortly thereafter gets torn up again for another project. So I think there are a lot of ways that we can find those inefficiencies and that we can work with those departments to set aside that money and try to save the money that we're spending poorly. So the city works to prepare for um, a recession every day. Um, we are we have a rainy day fund. We have an, something called an emergency sub fund. Um, there are limits to what we can uh, squirrel away for um, that rainy day. There's state uh, state limits established to how much we can put aside and not spend, um, and we're at those limits. And um, our budget director, to his credit, um, has been um, uh, developing budget practices that are really focused on um, a potential downturn. And, you know, it, it's important to keep in mind that in 2008, um, the city of Seattle, as compared to other cities, did really well in our downturn. But there, nevertheless, there was a time when we had to tighten our belts, and we did. And we took um, incremental cuts in every department across the board. Um, we, had re we had staff reductions in the city. Um, and um, we relied on our, our rep reserves in order to get us through and into a stronger place. That's, and I think the time. city has um, a history of being able to do that well. Um, Phil Tavel, your opponent led the city council passage of an income tax on the affluent, which is now working its way through the courts. Do you support that tax? Why or why not? 
Um, actually, I do. I mean, <laughs> my issue with it is that we're obviously spending a lot of money in the process of attempting to do a tax that currently is not supported by the law. But the fact is, when you talk about the impacts of the big companies we've had and the high earners that we've brought here, and when you say that there's, you know, these young tech workers that are making six-figure salaries that are leading to issues with our affordability, the fact that, you know, an expensive apartment isn't as much as if you're younger and you're making a lot of money, or if you're one of the people benefiting tremendously from, you know, our explosion here in the city and our successful businesses. So I actually do see the high earners income tax as a way for us to generate revenue in a non-regressive manner, which is what we've done so well in this state. So I actually do support that coming around. Lisa Herbold, could you talk about why you support this tax? Yeah, I'm so excited about this tax because I've never been so excited about this uh, tax before in my life because this tax will allow us to um, rely less on our regressive taxes. And the first priority for spending um, that I made sure was in this law when I introduced it was a commitment to the voters that we were going to dial down our reliance on the um, sales tax and on property taxes. So just like in Oregon, they have a they have an income tax and they don't have a sales tax, that's what we're going to be able to do here. Um, and not only is this terrific for Seattle if it passes um, or if it, pa it gets through the courts. Now remember, this, is th this was a court case from the 30s that was a 5-4 vote. So that's how close it was in the 30s. Um, the other thing that's so important, though, for our state is if we're successful here in Seattle, it will be able to be replicated in other cities throughout the state, which will then really help us address our statewide um, regressive tax system. And that will be good for everybody. Lisa Herbold, uh, you don't control the city budget, so what do you think the city is spending too much money on and why? What do I think we're spending too much money on? Um, well, you know, I think uh, one of the things that is uh, frustrating to me is that I, um, I supported um, efforts to find funding so that we could um, hire more police and grow the size of our police department. And um, despite the fact that we have funded that, we haven't been able to spend those dollars. And so um, we've been using those dollars for overtime. And so I think we're spending too much money on Seattle Police Department overtime instead of being able to use those dollars to hire police. And that's why I think it's so important that we work to get out from under the federal consent decree so that more officers will want to work for the police department. And we need to really work on other recruitment and retention tools for our officers. Phil Telfel, you've mentioned homeless programs. There's one area Seattle might be spending too much money on. Are there others? Um, I think from what I've heard and from what I've seen, I think within the Department of Transportation, I think we are spending a lot of money needlessly. Um, I'm seeing budgets for projects that when I talk to uh, engineers in other cities and in other locations, and, and in fact, some of the people here in West Seattle, especially on the West Seattle Transportation Coalition, that it seems like we're spending more money than we need to. Um, I do worry that some of our projects, especially in District 1 with respect to uh, some of the bike lanes we've created and some of the places where we've put bike lanes that aren't actually protected or separated but that are merged in with bus traffic and car traffic. Um, I think there's been a lot of money spent there needlessly. Um, and also I gotta admit, walking around District 1, I see a lot of places where we've spent a tremendous amount of money on the intersection curbs where you come off the sidewalk but five feet to one side or the other, the sidewalk completely falls apart, crumbles, or isn't even there. And so, you know, it's looking at spending that money intelligently that I think there are, there are some places within SDOT that we could save money and not spend it at least until the full project is completed. Should Seattle allow duplexes and triplexes on more blocks? And if your answer is yes, get specific about to what extent and where in your district you would like to see that allowed. Phil Tavel, you're first. So I, I think as we plan for this city growing and getting denser, we need to realize that we're gonna have to expand our idea of our urban villages. And I think one of the things we can do is we can look to, to see what those borders are now and expand them a little farther so we can bring triplexes and quad, potentially quadplexes or duplexes, but just more housing, but keep it as close as possible to mass transit so people have access to bus lines. Um, and so for me, it's really that. I think, you know, Westwood Village is one of those areas where somewhere 
near there, we can actually add a lot of that housing because of the services and the transportation that are there. Um, but in general, I think the idea of looking at expanding the borders of our urban villages is a way that we can find locations for those. I want to get a little bit more um, experience for the city um, around the new RSL zoning that we're using for single family zones within the urban villages. I want to find out a little bit, I don't want to wait too long to have the conversation because I know sometimes uh, sometimes it, it feels like development happens really quickly but sometimes it doesn't happen quickly enough in order to learn the lessons that we need to learn about planning. But we've just, uh, we've just changed all of the single family zoning within urban villages to residential small lot. And I'd like to see a little bit about how um, the development patterns change there before um, converting all of our single family neighborhoods into RSL. But I think that's a conversation that we have to have. The Planning Commission was here um, right before this, this event and they have some really exciting recommendations about how um, to have some increased density within some of the single family neighborhoods. I think it's worth looking, and as far as um, where, I'm working with folks in the junction um, to look at doing transit-oriented development um, and doing it's some neighborhood planning work. There are some legal issues with uh, implementing rent control in Seattle, but Lisa Herbold, do you support that? Is it worth the fight? Yeah, I've been really careful to try and say, because rent control means uh, it's a very loaded term and people have very definite ideas about what they think it is. Um, and so I've been really careful to say that what I support is I, I support removing the prohibition in state law uh, from having any rent regulation in cities and counties. I think we need to get rid of that and then I think we have to have a conversation in our city about what regulating rent means. Um, I don't know if it's rent control or rent stabilization like we've seen in other cities, or I don't know if it's um, limiting the number of times that uh, a landlord could raise rent, or the times of the year, or whether or not you have fa uh, a family. I think, I think the concept of regulating rent is one that we have to have here in the city, and we have to have local control, and we have to get rid of the state law that prohibits us from having local control. So I support rent regulations. Phil Tavel, do you support getting rid of the state law that keeps cities from implementing rent control, and do you support rent control? No, I don't. I don't support rent control. Um, having lived in New York City, I see how it creates an unbelievable administrative nightmare that can be, you know, misused in multiple ways. And I don't think you can really point to a city where rent control has worked. So I don't support rent control. Crosscut recently reported that Seattle police have returned to arresting and booking sex workers, a change from policy over the last several years. Do you believe sex work should be decriminalized? And if so, uh, should that be only for people selling sex or also for buyers? Phil Tavel, you're first. So I think it's very important that we look at people in the sex work industry, at the people that are selling, as victims. And after having represented many people in that situation, I can tell you that it is that case. It is a victimization. And so, you know, decriminalizing that, I think, is a positive first step in making sure that we actually address the underlying problem and help people get out of that cycle. Um, however, it, it is a dangerous, slippery slope to start doing that. I like the idea that you know we would look at the filing standards on those cases, and because sometimes when someone is arrested in that situation, it's an opportunity to get them help. I know I've been involved in several cases where when a sex worker was arrested, it actually gave them an opportunity to get out of that cycle. And so not prosecuting it, as we've, I think, unfortunately chosen to on a lot of crimes where we shouldn't have, I think that's one place where it is a good idea. And as far as for people buying it, that's a different story, and I, I do not support the decriminalization of that. I support continuing to prosecute people uh, purchasing sex. I actually worked with uh, Senator Cole Wells um, when she was um, at, at the state um, in her efforts to change the um, term prostitution to commercially exploit commercial sexual exploitation. Um, they made some changes in the state law that then we were able to make some changes in our city law um, that prior, that allow us to prioritize um, help for um, uh, the, the, the folks that are um, sex workers and and uh, prioritize helping them and whilst continuing to prosecute the, the purchasers of sex. Uh, but the, the, the 
the problem that we're facing right now is that um, we don't have enough funding for LEAD, and so officers aren't able to make referrals to the LEAD program, and that's why they're returning to prosecute prosecuting uh, sex workers, and so we need to expand funding for LEAD so that the police officers can return to referring those folks to that program. Lisa Herbold, what's the most pressing public safety problem here in District 1, and what should be done about it? So um, the uh, police department works every year um, to do these micro-policing plans. And across the board in every neighborhood in District 1, including South Park, um, the number one identified uh, problem um, that people note. Um, last year it was police visibility. Uh, this year it is property theft. Um, in any, in either event, whether or not um, it's a you, you want more visible policing or you want to deter what are often uh, crimes of opportunity, police staffing is the way to get at the issue. We need to grow the size of our police department. We made a commitment in 2014 to grow the size of our police department by four, by 200 officers. We're falling behind. As I mentioned before, I firmly believe that getting us out from under the consent decree is the way to improve hiring, and I support that, and I also support doing more for retention of existing officers and hiring new officers. That's why I voted to fund the hiring bonus program that pays officers $10,000 when they time. move here. That's done. Phil Tavel, how would you answer that question? What's the most pressing public safety issue facing this district and what should be done about it? So I sit on the Southwest Precinct Advisory Committee and from that each month I'm there actually as a representative of the Morgan Community Association talking about the things that I hear from the people that live, live in the Morgan Junction and then listening to the people who live all around District 1 and including the police officers about what those issues are. And the two things right now that are pretty much going hand in hand are the rise in property crimes, you know, theft in general, theft inside stores, interestingly, as much as anywhere else, and also the rise in violent crimes, the rise in people being approached and being sometimes now attacked by people in our community. And I'm hearing it from the people on the doors, I hear it from my community, and I'm also hearing it from the police that those are the main concerns right now. And I know from talking to them, uh, we need to start thinking about really addressing those issues, and it's a staffing issue with police that's going to come first. And I know uh, Captain Davis at the Southwest Precinct has been asking for more officers for a while to be able to have foot patrols and bicycle patrols, and that's only going to happen if we, one, do get out from under the consent decree, but two, if we have a city council that is supportive of our police department and that works with them to make sure that their morale is high, they want to live here, they want to work here and they want to support us. I'd, I'd like to follow up uh, 30 seconds for each of you. Lisa Herbold, to start with you. Um, we hear from some groups in the city who worry about an increase in police staffing. They worry about certain communities being over-policed. Mm -hmm. Is that something you hear from constituents and what's your response? It actually isn't. Um, the folks that I hear from in our low-income communities, particularly South Delridge, um, Highland Park and, and South Park. Um, they want more visible policing uh, because they believe it's a deterrent. I'm not going to pretend that there isn't um, a concern around disproportionality in policing also. Um, but I also want to say that they that folks have a, a really full picture of what public safety means and that's why I, I brought together a South Park Public Safety Task Force to make a whole bunch of recommendations in addition to law enforcement recommendations. Uh, actually, that is something I have heard, um, especially in communities here in District 1 that are more immigrant and more minority based that unfortunately they've been the victims of some biased policing and they've seen some of the outcomes that that feel as though the police are targeting them unfairly and you know as a public defender I also see this that this is a concern so even though we do need to add a lot of police, we do need to have better police visibility and response times. We need to be careful and we need to make sure that the policing we're doing is unbiased policing. Phil, some people are advocating for a safe drug consumption site in Seattle as a harm reduction measure. You've said you oppose that. Could you explain why? Well, yeah, I, I do not think a safe injection site is something that we need. I think it's interesting, when you take a look at the report that uh, the city was basing their proposal for having safe injection sites on, it actually talks about the fact of having people the ages of 15 to 69 accessing these sites. 
And when I read that, the first thing that jumped to my mind is how, as a city and a society, could we possibly think that it is reasonable or safe in any fashion to allow people as young as 15 to be doing heroin, to be injecting themselves? And so I believe in harm reduction. I think that is something we have to have as part of our response to the opioid crisis. But I think, unfortunately, when you have the idea of a safe site, you have people that are going there. There is increased crime on the, in the areas around it. And unfortunately, a lot of the drug dealers know that. They know that people will steal things on their way to those safe injection sites, sell them, get the drugs, and then inject themselves. And so as much as I want to see harm reduction as part of it, it's not as safe injection sites. Lisa Herbold, your thoughts on safe uh, drug consumption sites? Yeah, I don't call them that. I call them overdose prevention sites. And if you have um, somebody that you care about uh, in your life who's an addict, um, a place where um, they can do what they're going to do anyhow and not die is, is priceless. It's also an investment um, in a reduction in reliance on law enforcement and um, uh, law enforcement response uh, and uh, emergency response and, and, and hospital costs. You know, it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough call, but you can't both say that you support harm reduction and you don't support um, an overdose re prevention site because that's that's actually what it is that it is a harm reduction strategy and it links people to treatment and services that they desperately need that will make sure that they um, have access to to um, to. That what they need to um, get off of drugs when they're when they're ready to take that step. It's also an HIV uh, prevention and Hep, hep A prevention, and then finally, you know, it's, it's it's it in Vancouver they actually found that it, a reduction in crime. So you, you've both talked about the staffing question at Seattle Police. Are there specific programs that the city should implement to hire and retain officers? Uh, sorry, Phil Tavel. Oh, uh, I mean, as far as programs, it's having a city council and a mayor that are act and a city attorney that are actually on the same page with the police force. Their issue is they don't feel supported. They don't feel like they're working together. And even with the King County prosecutor. And I think, unfortunately, when you set out an idea now that you know, you don't arrest for all the crimes. Crimes that you arrest for, they don't get charged. You know, you've got a city council that will refer to, refer to the police as murderers and, you know, support giving them more money but do it reluctantly, you know, and not thank them for the job they do and not recognize how difficult that job is, that we're asking them to right now be trauma specialists and social workers and being under the consent decree. That, those are all the things that we need to fix to be able to hire and retain because when a, you know, when a police officer is looking to either move here or become a police officer, they have to think that they're operating under a consent decree. They have a council that doesn't support them. They have a prosecutor that's not prosecuting their crime, so why are they going through the trouble? You need to fix those three parts and at the same time make sure that you are paying them and you are supporting that's and staffing time. them properly. It's time. So it really upsets me when I hear people refer to um, a council that doesn't support the police department. There is one person on the council, and we cannot all be held accountable for the things that she says. Um, myself and the other seven of my colleagues take every opportunity we have to thank the men who, and women who serve our city and keep it safe. The objective way I have of showing my support for our police, in addition to publicly thanking them whenever I can, is to um, support their budget. 55% of the city's general fund budget is public safety. In the three and a half years that I've been on the council, we've increased the size of the police department's budget from, from $300, or $300 million to $400 million. Our police department is the highest paid police department in the state. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I've voted to support uh, recruitment programs that pay officers $10,000, whether or not they're new officers or moving from another place. I support our police department. We're going to stay with you for this answer. Um, also, uh, Lisa, Councilmember Lorena Gonzalez has proposed new restrictions on large campaign donations. What, if anything, should be done to limit spending? 
Yeah, I think it's a really interesting uh, proposal that she has, and I know it's before um, the Seattle Ethics and Elections Commission. Uh, she has a, a unique legal theory um, that I think it's it's worth discussing. We passed district elections because we wanted uh, more control over who we elect. We wanted to bring elections home to a local level for accountability's sake. Um, and we also passed the democracy voucher program to keep big money um, out of our local elections. So, um, you know, in every reform that we do, uh, uh, every election reform, every civil rights reform, every, every renters for reform, you know, sometimes there's, um, you know, an unintended consequence. And in the case of democracy vouchers in, in district elections, the unintended consequences has been the rise of, in, of independent expenditures. And I think it's worth taking a look at a w whether or not there's a way to limit them. Phil Cavill, should be something more be done to limit campaign spending? Uh, you mean from outside the campaigns themselves? Yes. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think one of the biggest problems we have in our country today is the amount of outside money that we allow to come into the political process. I mean, you know, Citizens United set a terrible example and standard for the fact that we can have corporations spending incredible amounts of money to do whatever it is they want to do, whether it's supporting a candidate, supporting a proposition, or trying to affect change in government when they shouldn't. I support that coming out. Now, of course, someone's going to say to me, well, you were the beneficiary of all this money from downtown Chamber of Commerce. The fact is, I asked for their endorsement. I did not ask for their money. The money they've spent has sometimes caused our campaign more trouble, I think, than good. <laughs> and what I will say is we should remove that money from the political process. This process needs to be about the people running, about the people that we're running to support and represent, and it shouldn't be about outside interests coming in with insane sums of money to try to influence that race. Okay, we will move to closing statements now um, per a coin, very official coin toss before the debate. Lisa Herbold, we will start with you. You have 60 seconds. Thank you. A lot of people ask me why am I running, considering that so many of my colleagues have decided not to run. Because I love this district. I love doing this work. I love local government. Um, and I love raising your voices to um, help you be more effective in addressing the needs in your neighborhoods. Um, that's how I, that's my vision of how you do democracy. Um, when you feel like you have somebody working for you at City Hall and um, when together we can get the work done um, that affects your day-to-day -day lives, then hopefully you believe a little bit more in your city hall working for you, working for um, the city, and that we can work together on the bigger issues. I feel really privileged to have the endorsements of the 34th District Dem Democrats, um, Representative, um, um, uh, I'm sorry, Congresswoman Joe McDermott, I'm sorry, Cong <laughs> Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, Council Member Joe McDermott, um, and the King County Labor uh, uh, Council and the Stand. King County Democrats, thank you. When I decided to run, I decided to run because I see a city that is heading in the wrong direction. I see a city with failed leadership. I see a city that is not taking the right steps to help the people in the community and to do the things that we need to be a productive, healthy, safe community. And when we have an election, the whole point is to ask yourself, how are we today? Are we better than we were four years ago? And are we heading in the right direction? And I think that answer, as I've heard from literally thousands of people over the last year, is a resounding no. We need change. We need to do better. I've been endorsed by more than 100 local businesses, the local businesses that form the heart and soul of our community. And what they tell me and the people that I talk to on the doors tell me is we need a council that listens to us, a council that is for the people and by the people, not for a select few and by a select few, but that will implement the changes that we need to fix our city and go in the right direction. This is an amazing city and we need a voice that can stand up and be the leader that we need and that's what I want to be for you. I ask you for your vote and your support to change this city and make it what it can be, it's which time. is better. 
Okay, thank you. That completes tonight's debate. Uh, thank you for watching Seattle City Club's District 1 Seattle City Council debate. Again, we'd like to acknowledge the debate's presenting sponsor, Amazon, supporting sponsor, AARP, and host sponsor, Youngstown <laughs> Cultural Arts Center, for making this debate possible. And thank you to the candidates, and thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you.